Lauren, uh, welcome to the Learning to Thrive podcast. Um, how are you going this morning? Thanks for being here. Well, um, I'm in the past because it's evening in Toronto and the day before, so. True, uh, true. My, my morning tomorrow, I'm assuming, is going to be pretty great. <laughs> Let's hope so. Um, and I'm also welcoming today uh, Kylie Sinclair, our co-founder at Change Republic um, and our sometimes co-host of Learning to Thrive. Um, Kylie, how are you? I am great, Em. I have had a really kick-ass morning at the park. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, and we're also uh, welcoming one of Australia's um, most experienced and skilled learning designers, Jane Hudson. Hey, Jane. <laughs> How are you going? What an introduction. I've got something to live up to, I think. Yeah, you yeah. sure did. <laughs> um, so, Lauren, I was um, hoping to take a little, another trip back in time. Um, and you know, you have uh, worked for, you've had a, a long career already in learning development. You've worked for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines as their head of learning and training um, for Tata Consultancy Group. You have um, moonlighted in Melbourne as an L&D consultant. Um, you know, you've come up the ranks um, as a, you know, as a, back when training was called, well, when learning was called training um, and you've, you know, you've spent the last three to four years in your own consultancy. Um, but in 2016 um, or around thereabouts, you decided to go back to, um, to study uh, neuroscience uh, with Harvard and then Duke. So I wondered if you could tell us um, or share with us a little bit about why you decided to um, take that step and, um, yeah, maybe explain a little bit uh, about that experience for you. I mean, I would say that it's like this amazing, like life transforming story, but really what it came down to <laughs> was just, you know, it was... Um, I was opening a, a conference. I was doing a, a keynote and opening for another speaker. And this was like years and years ago. And, and neuroscience was just being started to get whispered. And I was like, what's this you say about the brain and learning? Huh? Why haven't I thought about that? Yeah. Okay. Let's go do that. Um, no, it was really, it was really just that moment of like, how did I not know this? But, and it was just that, you know, that really simple moment of really, no, how, how did I not know this? Um, which then led to sort of those initial curiosities and looking into it and doing all my Googling. Um, but then I was like, oh no, like we really, really need to know more about this. Um, and at the time, uh, there was a, a, a three-part series in, that Harvard was offering. And I was like, hey, if you're going to start learning about the brain, might as well start at the hardest place possible, Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was awful. It was so hard. It was the most challenging learning I have ever done as an adult. And that's after having moved, you know, multiple countries and picked up, you know, having to pick up different languages and habits and all of that. But no, um, sitting down after... X amount of years of informal education going back into a, a more formalized, you know, even though it was independent, it was ridiculously challenging from the level of just getting focused again. But then I started to realize I know nothing about science or the brain or, you know, even math, mathematics and I, we, we broke up in grade 11. It was a, <laughs> it was a fantastic breakup. And so... <laughs> And so all that was left behind. So when I started to study and when I started to, to really get into it, it was what I can only explain as a very true learning process, which included, you know, yelling at the screen and then crying at the screen and then just, you know, hiding, hiding under the table. And um, then, you know, basically feeling like a child again, reading things that I couldn't pronounce and trying mm -hmm. to spell them and sound them out just so I could say a word like acetylcholine, which I can now say, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Well done. Um, but it was the first lesson I learned there was that, you know, now, now when I reflect back of how much I know now is when the brain and your brain doesn't have the knowledge or the experience or any memories inside to start building upon, 
and you're going literally from ground zero of learning, it is very challenging because you're literally growing pieces of your brain, a network to represent that learning. Mm. And that's, you know, that's why learning is hard. It's the neurobiological process. So the more that I studied, um, eventually it did become easier, but it was, it was continual rehearsal of what I was trying to do um, and having to really go against my own biases about what learning was, my own behaviors about how I used to go about doing it and learning how to learn in the, in the same time. Mm. So I could really capitalize on, on what I was doing. So it, it was, it was a painful couple, couple of years <laughs> to mm. get, to get that, that, you know, those certificates. Um, but so worth it because then it enabled me to, to move forward with medical neuroscience, which was so, so fascinating, um, devastatingly fascinating, um, because unfortunately a lot of what we learn from, from medical neuroscience comes from, you know, cases of disease or, you know, mm. past or, you know, severe neurological disorders. So it's, um, fascinating, but devastatingly fascinating. Mm. Mm. Um, does it, I guess that medical, that medical neuroscience, you know, where they are looking at, okay, like strokes, um, you know, big, big car crashes. Um, was there some good moments that you kind of brought out of that? Like, was there some, so many. Nice take, so was there some hopeful takeaways? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, with the medical neuroscience, it's not just based on, it's based on, you know, case studies. So you get a lot more of the intricate case studies, but what you're learning there as well is not just about the brain, but as the whole, but the whole system right? You know, what's controlling what within the body and how are the signals being sent back and forth and, you know, basically allowing us to do absolutely everything that we do. So you get a more holistic picture of, you know, of what this really looks like. And um, I just told this story recently and I, so recently that I know that I won't cry saying it this time. <laughs> my, uh, my grandmother uh, was 98 when she passed and she was lived um, the majority of the end of her life in one of the best teaching hospitals here in Toronto at Baycrest at the Rotten Research Center. Um, they were best known for their work in Alzheimer's, um, anything that falls under the realm of dementia, learning and memory. Mm -hmm. And after I had done my medical neuroscience, and I understood what a stroke was and you know, different var variations of what a stroke could do to a person. Um, when it happened to my grandmother um, right in front of my eyes, I watched as everything started to, as the blood stopped flowing to what turned out to be the right hemisphere, um, her right hemisphere and, and took away part of her language abilities. And, um, just sitting there watching the whole process, which was terrifying. Mm. Uh, but I was so grateful at the same time to be able to like, you know, frantically run and be like, she's having a stroke. I know this for sure. <laughs> like, please come and help me. Um, so that was like, that was really good. Like it gave me, I know it sounds a little bit demented, but like it gave me a little bit of comfort just to just, just have that knowledge of, okay, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. Mm. Um, and then to be able to transfer that knowledge into my own experiences. You know, I got, um, you know, I wrote an article once um, two years ago when I was robbed. We, there, was a, there was a big robbery um, when I was traveling and I was shaken, like super, super. I was in, I, my body went into a state of shock and that was the first time I'd ever done it. Like had experienced that state of shock before. And because of what I knew about my brain, obviously the brain body connection, I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's calm down that emotional center. Let's get the you know, let's get the, the executive function back online. Let's make mm. sure the central nervous system is getting those signals so that my heart rate comes down. Mm. And when the police, when the police arrive, I can articulate myself in a way that's gonna help. Mm. So this this knowledge, and I know those are two like really like you know, sad and, and scary examples, but this knowledge moves us forward as human beings to understand how we operate, how we think, how we regulate and can, can work with ourselves, you know, with all of this. So there's so many fascinating stories that come mm. with all of, you know, the medical case studies, um, you know, there's the, the beauty, the beautiful ones we see with, you know, Alzheimer's patients um, who, and really sort of severe dementia, memory loss, but you're able to bring them back with memories of music and story. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, it's gorgeous. I did that with my grandmother while, while I still could. So there's so much that we take from the science and there's so much, I, I think I just told you, I just got off stage with a neurologist who was basically saying like, I, I think even as we breathe right now, there's like 74 new research papers per minute coming yeah. out. There's just, it's, it's almost impossible to stay up, you know, with that, with, with what's going on, but you know, it's all moving us forward. Yeah. It's interesting, like, um, there, I think, like, today's conversation, I've been thinking about it, and it's so relevant, because we can come at it from two angles, and one is that, you know, with, with the, um, uh, with the explosion of AI, and um, a lot of, a lot of things becoming digital, and becoming more automated, um, cognitive skills are obviously going to be the key capability areas moving into, you know, the future of work, so performance, and understanding our brain is um, extremely, you know, mm -hmm. so relevant. And then there is the the learning design angle. So how mm -hmm. can we, you know, how can we take that, um, you know, take what we know about the brain right now and apply that to create better learning? So I thought maybe we could start with, um, you know, I, I, probably the question around. Um, I, I, I'm really interested because, well. We had, we had, you know, a little po faux pas um, when I sent out the email about this podcast and I said to, um, I, I sent it out with the title, The Neuroscience of Learning. And I had a member come back to me and say, look, there is no, no neuroscience of learning. That's bull crap. Um, and I thought maybe we could start there with, with why, um, why, you know, why, why do we get pushback? Well, what, yeah, why do, why do we get that pushback? What do you think, what do you think um, is happening there? <laughs> Lack of education. Lack of education and the fact that, you know, for a very long time in, in the scope of learning, and especially within the L&D industry, they've put cognitive psychology and psychology up on a pedestal, which to its point, it should be there. It's very, you know, psychology is, it's older than neuroscience. Neurosciences are still you know, relatively new in comparison, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's just pure, you know, it, it's just pure lack of education and, and a little bit of ignorance as to how the two harmonize with one another. So mm -hmm. cognitive psychology and all the cognitive sciences that have given us, you know, these phenomenal theories and methodologies you know, we've got the Abinghaus curve, the forgetting curve, you've got things like desirable difficulties from Professor Bjork, you've got, you know, there's, there's so many that we can go, we can go into space repetition is also part of the, the cognitive psychologies, then you've got everything that has to do with attention, focus, all of it, but that was only one piece of the puzzle. And now we've got functional neurona neuroanatomy. Now, I think that there's a very large camp of people who still want who still want to sort of go against it only because they don't understand it and i get it i waved my white flag too and it's like hey people i wasn't doing it wrong i just didn't know how to do it better <laughs> so if you are you know and i think it's completely when you think about it if i said oh yeah no the brain has who cares about the brain and learning <laughs> it's just it's so irrational uh, I like it's like well we experience our lives we experience everything you know really through our our minds and our consciousness and our brains out yeah like, so why don't we why shouldn't we understand what's going on in there well it's it's you know I, I i would hate to to diminish it down to the to a machine but like you know if we look at it like a machine like you need to know how the machine works in order to you know to play with it so and i'm not saying that you know in the scope of the industry of learning and development that everybody has to you know all of a sudden you know download all the information that people like myself know or you know the neuroscience the cognitive neuroscientists but at a very fundamental basic level if you can't answer the question of how is memory encoded and that's a very loaded question in itself Hmm. You can't answer that question as someone is, who's supposed to be responsible for learning of someone else, for changing that person's brain because of something that you've created. Well, then you're missing. You're just, you're completely missing it. Hmm. You can't be learning without memory in my world. Hmm. It's Absolutely. learning and memory. So, so there's a disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. So start us then maybe with like a bit of a tour of the brain and then maybe we could like work down into, because it like, I read a lot of brain stuff um, and I know there's a brain, I know there's a mind and we've got the conscious 
conscious bits, but like what is kind of really handy to know when we're, when we're jumping in and taking that first tour? So, I mean, there's, there's sort of, you know, the basics, like you can start to sort of, you can see it as a whole and then sort of bring, you know, cut the pizza, if you will, right? So, you know, you got the two hemispheres, okay, there's your halves, right? And then you've got your, your lobes, right? And your lobes are basically like your neighborhoods, if you will. You know, and then you go deeper inside the lobes and then you kind of like you get to meet like the shops and the locals and everyone who works in there and, and how they work with one another. So it's it's really just this amazing planet of things that are happening in there at any one given time. But when you break it down, like when you like really, really break it down to the nitty gritty. I mean, if we really were to go into the world of quantum physics, we're nothing but energy. You break down a cell and it becomes, you know, it just becomes energy. But those little cells that we call neurons that, you know, that essentially make up our brains, those are the stars of the show. You know, we grow, you know, we, we start off with a, you know, roughly about 100 billion of them. We, we prune those down to about 86 billion. I don't know about you guys. I don't have 86 billion of anything. <laughs> so I'm already impressed. I'm super impressed <laughs> like with what goes on up in there. And then it's just governed by its reshaping and its reorganizing and just communicating through electrical and chemical signals. Hmm which is a very, you know, it's a, it's a broad stroke to, to sort of paint, to paint the picture of the brain like that. But it's when you see it and when you see it live, I know you saw it um, when we did eye design, when you see what is going on in there and it's happening as we're speaking right now, it's happening as we're looking at the screen. It's just, that is, that is what makes us us. And I don't think I'd be doing justice if I would say it's just the brain. You mentioned consciousness. Well, learning isn't just about the brain it's about the body it's about the mind it's all integrative right and now this is also why we're seeing lots of medical practitioners speak to this now it's not just about one thing it's about the integrative approaches that we take from all of it so if we refer back to what we were saying about you know why people think there's no place for neuroscience and learning well it's they haven't integrated it yet so i, was, I would, sorry i was hmm. just gonna say no, no, that. Please, please. It's an interesting question because, and I don't want to sound too cynical, and you can edit this out if you want, but I also, <laughs> there are trends that emerge in social media against professional groups, right? So the pushback against neuroscience, um, the pushback against Myers-Briggs, which is not scientifically based, I get that, but as a colleague said to me recently, a lot of people have derived a lot of benefit from using these different tools to understand how they work. So why would you reject understanding how you function? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's such a good point, like Jane. I think the other thing though that we've, you know, and again, this, this falls back into the category of if we were to go into neuro myths, right? Some of those things served us very well. And some of them we just convinced ourselves of for so long, we, we set that narrative, we set that neural pathway that we just believe it to be true. And I think that is also the challenge of when you're trying to change anything in the brain is when it believes something so strongly, it's gonna hold on to it for dear life. <laughs> and that's why it's hard, you know, habits are, are difficult to change, our behaviors are difficult to change. It's because the brain likes what it already knows. Mm. It's, you know, it's that simple. It's lazy. <laughs> I kind of, we can be lazy, resistant. I like to equate it like a three-year-old sometimes who's just like, st like standing in the corner, just screaming at me. I don't want to. I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk to that. I can really, I could really talk to the three-year-old um, and give you a lot of examples. Um, and um, it is, yeah. A lot of our listeners of the podcast are kind of leading learning departments and they're under pretty incredible pressure to help businesses drive change and it's notoriously difficult to achieve and manage. If I was sitting in that chair, what does neuroscience have to offer me in my sort of commercial practice of L&D and how do I go about understanding how to integrate that into my team's practice? It's so I'm going to tell you what my brain's instinctual answer just was to that because it was like, well, I can tell you, but they're not going to care. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think, and, and it's part of the reason why I left, I left corporate um, is because 
this was not being, I, I couldn't stand to see the consequences of the employees when they couldn't perform or they couldn't do something in time or, you know, and I was like, this is, this is just madness, right? This, they're not allowing um, for the process. And this has been one of the biggest errors with organizational learning is you don't give people enough time. Learning is a process, a neurobiological process that requires time. And when you think of something as simple as memory encoding, memory, enc memory gets consolidated while we sleep. So to think that someone could learn something in a four hour session or a two hour e-learning and then automatically already know it is absolutely preposterous, but it's the biggest pushback when it comes to business. What are you trying to save always time and money? Hmm. Hmm. So it works against them. I say to my L and D's who are, you know, who, who are still fighting the good fight from the inside out. I said, next time you go to a meeting and you want to, you want to argue that you need more time and not, it's not even you. It's the people who deserve to learn properly who need that time. I said, you grab three objects and you hand them over to that person who's standing in your way and you ask them to juggle. And if they can't juggle, you say, that's okay, I'll be back tomorrow when you've got that down. Yeah. Okay. So there's just a lot of unreasonable expectations, really. Immensely, <laughs> immensely. They're, they're, it's completely unreasonable what, they, what people expect other people to be able to do when it comes mm -hmm. to a learning intervention. Now, some things are easier than others. And maybe you just want someone to learn something, you know, for very immediate use. Okay, that's fine. That's training, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. instant transfer. But if you want somebody to encode something for long-term retention, well, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in four hours and eight hours. It's definitely not going to happen in a micro learning <laughs> for five minutes <laughs> that never gets revisited. So it's, you know, you can, you have to really understand what the expectation is from the people who are asking to do it. Do you want someone to learn for the short term or do you want them to learn for the long term? Because those are two very different interventions. And if you were in a position where, because we, we know that a lot of businesses at the moment are trying to re-engineer their businesses to sit more comfortably in a digital environment. And they have this kind of tension of, we have these amazing people who have served us for so long, but we need to reinvigorate our culture and learn these new skills. And it's not a short term problem. It really is quite a fundamental shift. Um, if you were, uh, say, a very bold head of L and D, you wanted to take that journey. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the practices that you would um, work on, and what would you change within your team to help that transition happen to longer term learning? The very first thing I would do is I would give them. Um, I would bring in someone like myself, a translator who can who can very you know with efficacy and with validity translate the science in practical and applicable ways and learn at the very basic level, the fundamentals of how your brain works. How does it learn and how does it encode a memory? At the very, very basic levels, just learn that, okay? And then it's a matter of, okay, now I wanna teach you about the metacognitive skills. How do you know if someone's learning? How do you know if it's being measured effectively? With those skills, you then know how to design with the same things. So it's your learning for yourself so you can be a more astute learner. And you know, with metacognition, you're looking at not only your ability to, to sort of capture and, and think about what you're thinking about, but you're also able to self-monitor and self-regulate. Now, as a designer of learning, this is incredibly critical, but it's something that people don't know because we want to just give people the information, right? But when we come to a metacognitive um, design, and we look at it from all angles, when you embed moments for a learner, not after, not in a test or a quiz at the very end when it's too late, but during the process where the learner can then say, ooh, you know what? I thought I knew that, but you just showed me that I didn't. Okay, mm. I haven't really learned it yet. Mm. Now, it's incredibly valuable from the learner's perspective because we don't want them going forward and, and you know, having created what we call a false memory or just not learned properly so they can't transfer the skill, the knowledge, whatever it is. From the designer's perspective, you're building in a measure, right? And I know that most organizations, they won't give money or time to ROI, which is really annoying, but 
when the designer is able to, to embed metacognitive practices into their designs, they can get the measures that they need. And they can basically say, okay, they get this point, I don't need to put this in again. I've just bought myself back time as a designer because my learners have just shown to me that they've retained this. Mm. But if they haven't, and there's a majority of them that haven't, then I now have a measure that says, maybe I need to look at this in a different way. Maybe I need to do something differently here. So all of this, and I mean, metacognition is like a really, really old theory, right? It's like from the 1970s, <laughs> but it still holds true where people didn't look at it though, is from this particular experience of how do we not only help it for ourselves, for our learners, but how do we embed it into functional design? Yeah. And Lauren, what, how do you just for, you know, mere mortals like me, how would you describe metacognition? Is that, I kind of think of it like mindfulness, but is that not really, that's probably not a technical kind of term. Would you be able to explain it in a little bit more detail? Yeah, metacognition is really your ability to, um, to understand your own cognitive processes. So that's sort of step one, understanding why or how you're thinking the way that you're thinking. Then it's a matter of, can you monitor that? And then can you regulate it? So there's, there's multiple sort of areas to this, right? But it goes well beyond that because when you start to transfer this into learning, you're, you're, you're going even deeper into the layers. But metacognitive abilities is something that I preach big time for people to learn as a human skills. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the mindfulness part of it. When you have the ability to, to be sort of in that present moment, right? When you're tapping into your executive functions and this can be, you need to practice. This is a skill. And I think this is where people really get the disconnect is you don't just, you know, wake up one morning and decide you're going to start thinking about what you're thinking about. It's not that easy. <laughs> so, uh, it's a practice. You have to build up the neural strength because what happens is when you're practicing, a, you know, a mindful activity, whether that's via meditation or, you know, yoga, and it doesn't even have to be those things. You can practice mindfulness. You know, yeah. You can do any, you can really do anything because the whole, the whole thing is, is you're training your attentional networks to focus, to bring your executive function really online and to calm down the emotional centers, which are very highly, highly connected. You know, the emotional centers of your brain, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex are very highly connected. And that's, that's really what we're trying to regulate here. When we look at metacognition is we need to calm down the emotional centers when we're in a state of high alert, because those take off the cognitive centers, they take them offline. Mm. So, you know, if you have a panic attack, if you're like, you know, raging or, you know, if you will, if you go Hulk, essentially, <laughs> if you turn into the incredible Hulk, you're not just going to, you know, say, calm down and everything's okay. I mean, when in the history of anyone saying to someone else, calm down, <laughs> have they instantly calmed down? So it's when we talk about metacognition, we're looking at it from the human element of how do we become more aware and self-present to be able to regulate our own thoughts and our feelings and our emotions. But then from the learning perspective, it's like a completely different type of awareness to, do I know what I know? Do I know what I don't know? And do I know what I think I know? So it's, it's a beat. Metacognition is a beast of a topic. Um, and it goes from the personal aspects of, of our human skill right through into the integration into learning. Hmm. But basically your tip is that if you're in an, an L and D team, you should be trying to upskill yourself on metacognition because it can easily translate into that kind of learning design process and yourself as a yeah. learner. Oh yeah. From, I mean, from, from the learning design process and like always, you've got to consistently, because this is where, when you're doing your learning needs analysis, especially, this is where you really want to use these skills of what do, you know, what do I know? What don't I know? What do I think I know? Right. And that's when your analysis and if you're doing focus groups or surveys or whatever, whatever it is that you're doing to to try to figure out what do I need to really focus on for someone to learn a new skill, knowledge or behavior. Then you have to extract from them what they think they know. So it's really got to be designed incredibly intentionally. And we can we can draw from behavioral science, um, you know, for um, uh, what's it called? It's called motivational interviewing. We can we can take skills from there. We can take things from psychology to really design more effective, you know, learning needs analysis through the lens of metacognition. 
So if I, if I know that you already know this, if 80% of my population already knows this, well, I'm not going to waste my time designing it in. There's content I can just put aside. But then with certainty, if I'm like, okay, you guys definitely don't know this. Okay, I need to, I, this is where I need to put some, some major focus in. But even more so is if you think you know it. Because if you think you know it, it's usually because you've got something else up in your brain that is networked to a similar thought pattern or skill or behavior. And is that a false memory? Or is that no, like no, false me a false memory is when you, you think <laughs> it, it's when you, you've sort of recreated something that didn't happen right. or you perceive, okay. you perceived it as happening and it didn't happen. So if you were to skim over some learning really quickly and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, no, okay. that happened, that, that happened, that module, that guy on the safety video, he was definitely <laughs> doing yeah. that and I'm going to go and do that, but that never happened. So, okay. All right. And so like memory, um, we touched on it a little bit and the memory encoding and in our brains, um, I've heard it described as like little, like when you're, what, what's kind of happening in that, the, the first, you said it takes time. Um, what's happening in the brain when we're trying to like grow a new memory? Well, it's, it's, if it's an, if it's a completely new memory, kind of like when I was learning, when I started, started my studies, you know, I didn't know what a dendrite was. I didn't, I didn't know what, you know, what the nerdst equation was. Um, that was literally a, a, a tree branch, if you will, growing out of a circle, which represents my cell, literally growing to represent that knowledge. And it would have to grow and make other connections. And then if I wanted it to be solidified, there's something, um, if I wanted it to sort of become an unconscious, I could, I could tap into it unconsciously, kind of like we walk, we talk, we drive, we do these things, we don't have to think about them anymore. Then that's when like that rehearsal and the practice really comes in. Where traditional learning was, okay, study this and then study this some more. And hey, how about you study this again? <laughs> For like hours on end, like rote memorization, are you going to get something in your brain? Yeah, you probably are. Are you going to retain it for any long period of time? can't guarantee that. So when we look at the process and I, and again, memory is a beast of a topic. Um, it's some, most of the lectures that I, I attend are on memory. And when you break it down to very, very specific parts of the brain, because memory isn't stored in one part, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's a network. There are very functional areas that are like the hippocampus, which is well known for long-term memory, but memory, you can encode it in multiple places in the brain, which is another thing I want designers to hear, right? Memory isn't just in one place, it's in multiple places. And when you learn what some of those places are, some of those places you can visit and store memory, you can design better. Mm. You can use those to design better. Um, but memory is, is, it's a massive beast. And it's basically, the goal is encode it, store it, retrieve it. Encode, store, retrieve, yeah. like so it's a famous name ladder. Lauren, my child, he's a, a four-year-old boy, is on the spectrum. And we're going through a behavioral intervention at the moment. And so we've spent quite a lot of time trying to understand, um, well, basically how to completely deconstruct the way you communicate and, re and rebuild it for someone who thinks differently. Um, but one of the things that the uh, therapist was saying to us was, well, you can tell your child not to run away 200 times and maybe he might start to stop or you can play games where he starts to run away and comes back and you can play that game 20 times uh, and he'll start to change his behaviour. So that's kind of what you're saying, that in workplace learning it needs to be much more kind of involved in the doing and the repetition of doing in lighter environments because it's easier to remember because your body is doing it's it. part of it it's it's part of it but kindly what i like what you just brought up with your example of your son is i think it's not nearly talked about enough is we have you know i think um we we fail to recognize neurodiversity in learning we, you know, it's a lot in, in, you know, K through 12, but you know, no, there is a whole industry of adults in the profession of learning who my guess are not thinking too much about the neuro, the, you know, people who are neurodiverse yeah. uh, and how to, you know, and, and how to sort of, you know, tap into what they might need. You might not even know, people might not even know. Now I'd argue in some places in the world right now, 
that we have to be a lot more strategic, more intentional with the way that we are going about our learning because our brains have changed because of the pandemic. Yeah. They have been high levels of stress. They, you know, it has been, the cognitive function has been, has been hindered by brain fog. Um, you know, the way that we even need to approach learning because all of our brains, whether we recognize it or not, have been changed by this one very historical event <laughs> in one way, shape or form. Um, so there's, there's a lot, it's interesting how, how something like this even has brought that conversation to light. And we're hearing more and more people talk about neurodiverse, neurodiversity um, in the scope of learning. But I think where we're failing to hear that conversation is in learning and development in business. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I know for myself, like an exact, it's very kind of random practical example, but I was saying to my son, uh, like, what are you having for lunch? And he would just sit there and kind of like, it would be like I haven't spoken to him he ha or he hasn't heard me. And then I would say, what's on your plate that you're going to put in your mouth? And he'd go, apple, sandwiches, strawberries. You know, go and list them, cheese, list them all. And I just suddenly realized that the way we issue instruction has to be so layered for people from neurodiverse backgrounds to even yeah. Un yeah. understand that an instruction has been given. Mm. I mean, there's a whole, like, that is a, that could be a whole person's job. <laughs> 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 It's, yeah, it's been a really kind of like probably switch my mind onto this topic. Mm. You know, you're not, we're not going to solve all, all the L&D issues um, by introducing neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience or any of it. Like it's just not going to happen. But I think that we're, we're failing. We're failing as an industry if we don't start talking about these things and, you know, screw the talking. I'm done listening to people talk. I'm done listening to me talk. Start to do Stop talking about how you need to upskill people and how people need to learn how to learn, but then not provide them with the accurate tools and resources to be able to do such a thing. It's enough. It's and absolutely enough. Lauren, if you were kind of, because you know in Australia we can get away with stuff here um, without anyone really noticing because they don't even know the gap. <laughs> <laughs> so if we were kind of working with our community of learning design experts and introducing them to some of these um, concepts, what would be some helpful resources for them to go and explore? Okay, so I would say definitely, you know, any and all information that you can start learning about um, metacognition, that's definitely a great one. Um, and I would very highly encourage any of our designers um, who are listening to really look into cognitive load. And that has to do with working memory, right? Yes. And it's, it's, it's really, it's something that we, we abuse, right? Instead of protecting it. So as yes. a designer, I need to protect your cognitive load because otherwise I exhaust it and you're learning nothing. Yeah. So I'd say if you can understand that and cognitive load is working memory, it's how much, how much capacity the working memory has that's, you know, and how much resource it has. So again, when you start to, to look at those things and even trying to protect it, then you're already a step ahead of the game, right? So a very functional way to do this is that if you look at the content, right, if you have like a slew of content and you've got all these things that someone needs to learn and you're looking at all of this material that you've got, look at it as like, as if you were like building blocks, like, you know, a tower full of blocks and every block is a piece of your content. Well, if you take the content out, does the, does the tower fall? And keep taking it out until the tower might fall. Because if it doesn't, then your learning is stable. You don't need all that extra garbage in there. You know, you don't need those nice to knows and great to haves or, you know, in, and that's what the, con that's only with the content. When we go into the more intricate, you know, realm of design, and we know that people know like, okay, you shouldn't put too much words on the slide and you shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be, but why? Do you know why that is? Mm. Well, it's not because it looks like crap. It's because it's going to like exhaust your brain before it even gets to the second module. You know, it's that cognitive load and seeing your brain, not as one resource, it is hundreds and hundreds of little resources in there that you need to protect. So we've all experienced Zoom fatigue and just too much screen time. That's because the occipital lobe, 
the, 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 the primary lobe for our vision has been just on hyperdrive, <laughs> processing everything that we're seeing. Not to mention, then we've got our auditory, you know, like everything that's happening in the auditories. And then we've got, you know, things that are, it, we're looking at, you're looking at things that are moving, things that are, you're listening to, decoding color, listening to words, understanding the words, putting those together in a sentence. The brain is doing all of that at once. And so when you think about it like that, you know, think about how much energy the brain is super, super expensive and its currency is energy. So if we can save energy and we can save a resource because we don't need that music playing in the background, as fun as that music is, <laughs> we don't need it. It's taking away the brain's resources to focus. It's using up the energy. You know, do we need that graphic image that, you know, just looks cool? Probably not. Extra buttons? Who knows? You know, like it's, it's really, when you start looking at it like that in the cog, and so those two things is what do you know? What don't you know? What do you think you know? and then protect the resource. That's your job is to protect the resource as the designer. Use it as, as effectively and as efficiently as you can. Mm. So a lot of um, learning departments are kind of racing to this model of learning like a movie. You know, there's um, little elements of video and then there's animation. And in part, it's because we're trying to recreate the high media values we experience through social media like our learners have become conditioned to this kind of high level of production values in their daily um, online experiences and so sometimes the learning feels quite jarring are you um advocate advocating to kind of dial that right down no, I think there's epic. I mean, there's, I know, I know some people who are in film and in production in the learning landscape, but they're also integrating the science. So they know how to tap into novelty, which the brain loves. We know that the brain, you know, we, we love stories. It's how we've developed, you know, a, we've developed societies. It's how we pass things on. So stories are really great, but what are you trying, what are you remembering of that story that is going to functionally change your skill? behavior or knowledge yeah you can have all the production value in the world like you know but if i can't do anything with that really cool story <laughs> if i can't transfer that into something functional for how i need to operate well then it was just a really cool story and the same thing goes we can talk about you know um ai and vr and and all of these things right everybody wants vr right now but Go to the scientists and i believe me i have i'm sitting in their lectures there's no efficacy to learning retention or sorry to memory encoding with vr yet they don't have the research yet it's engaging as heck people like to spend time in it but as far as like encoding of memory there isn't solid evidence yet from the science itself but there is transfer which is good so it's interesting what they have seen in one case uh, case that was done was it was a, a false memory was created, but in, in this case, it was a good one because the person had gone into a VR setting to do some soft skill training and it was for, um, it was for a call center. And after they took their first call, it was the, they said, um, they got the feedback. Oh, that was really good. You know, you did a really great job. And the person said, yeah, I did it before I've done it before. So their brain had fooled them into thinking they had done it in the real world when really it had been done in virtual reality. So it was, it was an interesting, it was a, it was a positive win for a false memory. <laughs> so, so we're going to get there. We're going to yeah. get there. But you know, if, if you're going off and wasting money and budget on things that you haven't, you know, consulted your design team with, then don't expect them to be able to design within something that you just thought was shiny and new. Mm. Consult um, your teams. <laughs> James? I was just going to say, I think that hits a really a good point because I was just listening to the conversation and um, where Kylie, Kylie led in around the experience can be quite jarring because people are uh, really caught up in the bells and whistles. And instantly my head went, you must have a learning designer driving these, not the IT people, not the software people, not the tech gurus. The learning designer needs to understand how people learn in all the different ways and retain control over what bells and whistles do we have, what bright shinies will we include? Because sometimes really all you need is a pen and a piece of paper, you know? 
yeah. So that was my, that was my, um, go the learning designers of the world. <laughs> They've got a hard job again. Um, they've got a hard job, um, as we all know, but it's a rewarding one. Um, Lauren, you touched on it a little bit um, before in terms of um, talking a little bit about cognitive overload um, and the, you know, the phones that we carry around with us and the email notifications that we have. And one of the, I'm really, really interested in cognitive overload because I do, you know, we hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, I'm just getting old, I'm forgetting stuff, um, when really we are, over, you know, we are overloaded with information where we're taking in so much more information than we were five years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, and that kind of led, has been, I've been just starting to think about learning in the flow of work because we are doing more of it now and we're doing less um, of the sitting, you know, sitting in groups or well, some of us are doing less and, and more digital learning, which feels like it's learning in stolen time. Right. So like we're kind of, I, I mean, the majority of people I know, we, you know, we will arrive at the, at the desks. You've got 50 emails. You've got someone tapping you on the shoulder you, you know, you, you, your phone's going off with notifications and um, it's happening in kind of, it's happening at the right time, but we're so distracted and how, like, how are we supposed to learn when we are that distracted? Do you think designers should be taking into account that people are going to be distracted and, you know, are you trying to solve for that when you're thinking about ways of design that these, that the learners are increasingly distracted? Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Absolutely. This comes in with the intentionality of the design itself. So there's, you know, if you, attention, so attention is the mechanism to focus. So if you know, and there's, there's not just one network of attention in the brain. There are multiple attentional networks in the brain and they all act as different, you know, they, they all connect to different places and they do different things, right? So if you know, first of all, what those networks are and how to tap into those for design, you can dim the lights on some portions of the brain while shining the, you know, shining the rest, you know, on what you want to focus on. When it comes to your own, just like when it comes to learner distraction though, I mean, that's something, unfortunately, we're never going to have control over. We can tell you at the very beginning of the day, turn your phone off, close up all the tabs, like that really, and let's circle back, become metacognitively aware, you know, look at your desktop and just ask yourself periodically throughout the day, what do I need to focus on? Okay. Then look around, but what am I giving my attention to? Mm. Well, my phone's on, so that's getting my attention. I've got multiple tabs open, and the second I see a notification, that's getting my attention. And then my door's open, so someone could walk in, so that's getting my attention. And the radio's on in the background, so that's getting my attention. Hmm. We're spreading our attention too, too far, and therefore we can't focus. So you have to cultivate the mind, and you've got to cultivate the environment. And also the body, too, right? You can't, like, you can't focus in a state of distress. So you know, intentional breath, I know it sounds ridiculous. I stopped my sessions and in, you know, partially partial way through to take intentional breath mm. because it will calm the central nervous system down. It will put the focus where I need it to. I could do something as simple as just snap, count my snaps. Mm. I wasn't even paying attention to you guys during that moment. I'm just like, okay, one, two, three. <laughs> Something like that. I can look around the room and look for one particular object in multiple different places, or I can look for one color. Mm. I can use my attention to harness my focus, mm. but I need, you need to learn how to do that, <laughs> right? So that's why I say the metacognitive skills as a human being and as someone who's designing learning and as someone who is learning themselves are so diverse. They're so agile but you got to learn them mm. and you got to know what they actually do. So, you know, and the other thing too, I think there's not one session that I've done where I haven't started off with sit back, relax, enjoy, be curious. You're going to learn nothing. 
Mm. <laughs> just, relax. just relax, you know, let your brain just take it all in and diffuse. It will do it's, it. You know, you're going to have to do some heavy lifting soon, but not on the first hour. <laughs> like, like, you know, in that, those facilitated group sessions is that you, you know, you're, you're brought into the room and told to relax and, you know, some great, you know, some great people might do like a, a breath session that means you can, you know, maybe calm down if you've had an anxious morning, but with, um, you know, with learning on the job as we go, potentially in a heightened anxious state, um, you know, it feels like we're almost setting ourselves up for failure there. If we're not really addressing um, the capabilities of the employees and giving them the capability to be able to um, really manage themselves. Um, you know, it's interesting because you're, you're always going to want to have those designers of learning. But when you look at the whole, you know, and I'm, there's a lot of people who hate me when I say this, but I know I could walk into a small to medium sized organization, spend six to, I'd say minimum six weeks, but I probably spend a good few months training the internals on how to properly learn and practice all of these skills and effectively eliminate the need for a learning and development team. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and I would have been one of them. I would have making myself obsolete as well. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's when you've got the harmonization of people who are aware of how they learn and when they're not learning, coupled with the people who are designing effectively for that process. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got a great learning department. And now you've got a great learning culture. Less wastage. Less. Oh, 100%. Oh, when, your, your productivity, the productivity levels will, will definitely be significantly increased because you're not wasting your time having to revisit things that you never learned in the first place. Mm. You're not going to Google as much. You're not going to look through the LMS to see where that part of that three minutes of that video were that you can't remember because you didn't learn it, right? So there's so much time that's wasted by ineffective and inefficient learning. Mm. Design is definitely a massive, massive component to, you know, to helping the efficacy of it. But at the end of the day, there's so much more that people come to the table with, you know, they're stressed, they're emotional, they've been locked away for a year, they, you know, there's so much more going on that I think, like I said earlier, if we start to look at it from a very holistic level, a very holistic level of it's not, you know, first of all, as, as much as it's my profession to be a scientific learning designer, everything I say, is so transferable and just to being a human. These are really awesome human skills, like incredibly human skills. You know, can I think about what I'm thinking about in the moment that I need to? Yeah. And how does that help me? Well, I'm not gonna lose my mind when someone cuts me off in traffic or, you know, when someone takes the last roll of the toilet paper, I'm not gonna try to fight them for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but it's also things like, you know, when we're working and we're banging our head against the wall because we can't figure something out. Well, how long do I stay in that state? Mm. How long do I stay in this? I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to keep looking and I'm going to keep researching. No, I'm going to be aware of that so much sooner so I can get feedback or get the resources I need. And that's part of being a good learner as well. Well, I don't really know this. I'm not really getting it. I can waste my time reviewing something over and over and over again, or I can find the additional, I, I can have the self-awareness that I need external help. So these skills go across the board and, you know, they're definitely not limited to, to just learning or learning design. This is about, about us, you know, about this gorgeous three pounds of jelly <laughs> in our, you know, in our heads that just kind of do everything. Um, Jane, did you have a um, question? I saw maybe you had a question face. Oh, did I have a question face? That might have been my question face. No, I was just listening. I don't have a question. Maybe just a comment to say that a lot of what I'm listening to, I feel, links back to the question that um, that was asked earlier about what what do how does this help L and D managers in organisations? And I think where, if nothing else, where it can really help is just it, like you're saying, human skills, Lauren. It's about yeah. understanding people. What is a reasonable expectation to ask of them when you bring them, for example, into a learning environment? You know, the neurodiversity, understanding that people do learn in different ways and, and that because they can't pick up something academic, like they're not academic, doesn't mean that they can't learn or they're not intelligent. It's just embracing that neurodiversity. So that's two things, I think, for me, 
as an L&D manager that is really helpful just to understand my people, what's reasonable to ask them to learn in a given space of time. How do we reinforce that learning? So it is learning in the flow of work um, and as they're doing the job. Yeah, so that's kind of what I think where neuroscience can help L&D teams and departments who eventually will become defunct if Lauren gets to rule the world. Um, <laughs> You know, well, I think we'll be doing more some super exciting things as well. Like you know, we'll never become defunct. There'll be some other. Um, oh gosh, yeah. This, but like, I'm, like, I'm only, I'm only teasing. <laughs> Imagine. Um, can I just ask a quick question, um, Lauren? We are onboarding someone at the moment. Um, what should we be doing more of and less of in onboarding in the onboarding process? <laughs> what have you seen that's good, even? Well, really bad. <laughs> I um I went through a good six month period with a with a colleague of mine where it's like all we did was redesign onboarding programs and for very large, well known institutions around the world. And where the biggest fails were were and it was actually funny right before right before covid um the last place that i was i was presenting to 300 people at uh at a kickoff and um i was opening the session and one of the when we went to q a one of the ladies she raised her hand and she was asking this she's like so i'm new <laughs> and there's a lot to go a lot to learn and there's a lot to do here what info like what tips what can you can you do for me you know how can you help me and i said hold on a second i'm like is your manager in the room it's like give this woman some time to learn please so the first thing is to slow down the process right and really think intentionally and strategically how you can take what they need to learn but scaffold it how does it what where do you start Where's the first place you need to start to get that person to functionally be able to operate and do something and then start building upon it. So it's like putting together the most perfect puzzle piece, right? Every piece has to go in its place, but at the right time. And this is where design comes in. You need to be incredibly intentional and strategic when you are designing like this. So you really have to put a lot more time and effort into, okay, what's really important does the person need to know the history of the company on day one probably not <laughs> is that really going to make them successful do they need to be um you know paraded around the office like a show horse and introduced to a bunch of people whose names they're not going to remember probably not <laughs> so there's so many of these little things that we just fail to remember because it's always been designed the same way mm. so what is it that you really need when you're onboarding somebody and you want them to be successful within those first however many days you need them to be is what can you teach them that will allow them to develop the skill the behavior the habit all right how do you tramp because they have to transfer it and then how during that time period again very strategically designed is how are you monitoring it and how are they monitoring themselves again metacognitive skill to know if they've acquired it. So it's gotta come from both ends. So scale back on the content. So remember, look at your onboarding, mm -hmm. build the tower, build the blocks. Which blocks don't, don't you need right need, now, yeah. right? And then, because a lot of onboarding, it's just, it's ridiculous. So, I mean, I've done a lot of onboarding training when I was in corporate, like in going through different jobs. And for the most part, let's be honest, Onboarding, especially when it's when it's taken over to an e-learning module, people just sit there in Amazon shop and just it plays in the background and they have like a, you know, usually they get three attempts at passing a quiz and, you know, one out of three they'll get. So <laughs> tick, done. But if you want someone to feel successful, motivated and valued in the work that they're going to be doing for you, then you've got to give them the opportunities to learn how to do so. And, you know, learning who Jane is, sorry, Jane, your name came, your was right there in accounting. Yeah, that's probably important, but not right away. Hmm. So yeah, you got it. You got to really, you got to really sort of take into consideration what it is you want that person to learn and, in, and what's more critical, right? Hmm. If it's a large organization, it's a larger, I've been in large organizations where I've redone their onboarding processes. And, you know, sometimes with these very, very large ones, we're looking at, a, they, they were looking at seven weeks, seven weeks 
of onboarding. But within the first day, with, excuse me, within the first week, that person couldn't tell you where the bathroom was. They couldn't tell you where they were supposed to hang their coat or how to get to the parking lot from other exits of the building. If my mind and my body are in a state of stress because I don't know my environment, then I can't learn. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm back in high school where I'm looking for the homeroom. <laughs> like, where's my locker? And who, you know, what's going on? So it's it's a loaded question because there's so many different variables that you can look at when you look at onboarding programs, but mm-hmm. build your tower, remove what you don't think is necessary, yeah. set them up for motivation and you know, wanting to transfer that skill. Yeah. And then monitor it. And I think like the big learning for me today is strip it back, strip it out go back, strip it out. Does that need to be there? Like, <laughs> well, like, again, you can use the tower or you can just be like, imagine yeah. that you're just throwing more stuff in that, you know, if your brain, if you look at, if you're looking at your stuff and you're like, if you had to learn that yourself and you picture that your head is going bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> until it's like, how much more can get in there? Yeah. And it's too much. yeah. Um, well, we know it's um, late there. So we it's nine o'clock. It's nine. nine o'clock. <laughs> uh, we have children, so that is the absolute limit of our day. <laughs> <laughs> um, we wanted to say thank you so much. Um, we'd love to stay in contact with you. Now. I want to come back to Australia. Greatly, you know, the second that 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 I came, that I'm allowed to come back, I'll be uh, I'll be walking around looking oh, for the so latest yeah. in the supermarket. Cool. <laughs> be well, hopefully, like by the end of the year slash next year, we might be able to have a big fat learning conference, and you know, <laughs> just in there like and taking lots of useless information and you know, great information as well. <laughs> We have to tell you that our version of a, a learning conference is in some glamping tents on Emily's farm. <laughs> in the, in the I am, I am, sign me up. Sign me up. Cool. Sign me up some more. <laughs> hey, Emma, I mean, if people can do yoga with goats, we can do learning with horses. Like, I'm all for yeah. it. <laughs> well, yoga with learning in a fa- you know, farm environment be like part of the brain um the brain conference um cool well i've got a thousand more questions but maybe that'll just make for part two um and so lauren jane kylie thank you for joining us on learning to thrive today and um yeah we'll we'll see you next time we are thanks so much